Well, this has been a long time coming, so I originally planned to give my thoughts on Pokemon Sun and Moon right after I first beat those games, which was around the end of last year, but, well, I got caught up in a lot of other things at the time. But I guess while I'm on the subject of making other thoughts on games videos, I might as well get this one done finally. Before I start though, let me just remind you this one's going to be far more heavily based on opinion than the other two. Pokemon is a series with a huge scope of appeal. There are an infinite number of ways to play a Pokemon game, and none of them are right or wrong. There are a lot of aspects of the series, like Pokedex completion, that I personally don't care about at all. But there are aspects that I'm into, like breeding, that a lot of other people aren't. So just bear in mind, the vast majority of things that I say in this video can really only be applied to how I personally play a Pokemon game. I also definitely won't be able to give my thoughts on every little tiny thing, because, like I said, Pokemon games are huge, and there's only so much time I can spend on one video. But let's get right into it. For context, I already made quite a few videos on what I thought of the previous new generation Pokemon games, X and Y. Now, I adored Black and White. To me, they were the first Pokemon games that truly felt fresh and original in many, many years, and I love them for that, and I love the fact they tried to take risks. And for those very reasons, I did not like X and Y very much at all. X and Y were very much the polar antithesis of Black and White, and were definitely made to appeal to the people who loathed the fifth generation having much more emphasis on old Pokemon over new, and tons and tons of Gen 1-er pandering. Despite all of the really great multiplayer features that X and Y and the 6th Gen in general had, I just couldn't get past this. It soured me so much on the game that these were pretty much designed for Gen 1-ers, and... As a result, X and Y became my second least favourite main series Pokemon games, next to the original Diamond and Pearl. This is in a lot of ways understandable. Like I said, Pokemon has such a broad scope of appeal that it's impossible to please all sectors of the fandom at the same time, and X and Y really went after one while heavily alienating the others. To me, I feel like Sun and Moon definitely acknowledge this. It tries to be a kind of middle ground between Gen 5 and Gen 6 fans. Addressing many of the complaints about the main storyline in X and Y, while still keeping a lot of the quality of life features and multiplayer aspects of Generation 6. And I feel that it does succeed in a lot of ways. To me, its main storyline wasn't quite as good as Black and White, but it was a definite step in the right direction after X and Y. However, in the other direction, I do feel like the 6th gen did some things better when it comes to the connectivity features. Before I directly get into discussing the main adventure though, there's a few things about Sun and Moon themselves that I wanted to talk about right now. I really like a lot of subtle additions these games have, things that I never really would have thought about until now and realised, wow, they haven't done that yet? As an example, the fact that when you evolve a Pokemon into a form that you haven't got Pokedex data for yet, you now actually get to see its Pokedex description. I know it's such a minor thing, but it's something that I really loved, and something that again, I thought to myself, why haven't they done that sooner? Having a map of the area you're in on the bottom screen at all times. A shortcut button for using Pokeballs in battle. Greatly simplifying the text you have to go through to decline learning a new move. That I'm really glad for, because before it got a very, very awkward. Do you want to not learn this move? Uh, no. Are you sure you want to give up on learning this move? No, I mean, yes, I mean, ah! Yeah, I felt that was really clunky earlier, and the fact they've simplified it to just, if you say no, that's it. You've said no, and you don't get the move. Another thing that sounds really minor, but that I do like, actually changing the level up jingle and the item get jingle. They've remained the same stock sound effects for so many years, even decades, that it feels really refreshing to actually hear new ones, and it actually makes going back to earlier games sound really awkward. And one thing also that I really love about these games, the way they presented the Pokedex. Like I said at the start of the video, I have never cared for Pokedex completion at all. It's just never been something that appealed to me. 
but the way they actually give you a percentage tracker and the fact that every time you register a new Pokemon, you get that big registered text. I know that sounds like a silly thing to like, but it makes me feel much more compelled to actually fill my Pokedex now, and the percentage tracker means that it's something that I might even consider in the future, despite me never having cared about it before. I suppose while on the subject of the Pokedex, I'm kinda air on the whole idea of the Rotom Dex. I'm pretty ambivalent. I don't love it, and I don't really hate it either. I feel like not very much was done with it from a story standpoint, and... Am I the only one who feels it was a total missed opportunity that you couldn't actually get the Rotom to join your team in the post-game? I know that it involved um, doing some weird stuff with the text and making it so that the Pokedex won't talk to you while the Rotom's in your party or something, but it still felt weird they made such a big deal about the Rotom Dex, despite Rotom itself not even being in Alola. Anyway, now I'm going to get on to talking about the main adventure. Firstly, more from a gameplay standpoint, and secondly, from a story and character standpoint. So, in terms of actual gameplay, there are quite a few improvements they have made over X and Y. The first most notable one to me personally is that the experience share is shockingly much less broken than it was in X and Y. I was at first disappointed to see that the experience share, the Gen 6 experience share, that is, came back, because it was one of the most disgustingly broken mechanics in all of Pokemon. Back in X and Y, I saw many first-time playthroughs that ended in the mid-80s at the Champion, who has mid-level 60s Pokemon. This was a common theme. If you used the experience share throughout the game, you tended to be about 20 levels higher than you were supposed to be. And it made the whole game effortlessly easy. I know Pokemon games have never particularly been hard, unless you're doing a self-imposed challenge run, but this was ridiculous even by Pokemon standards. Here, though, the actual levels of the trainers you fight are all balanced around the experience share. At first, I was iffy on enemy trainers usually only having one or two Pokemon each, but their levels are usually much higher, and now that I think about it, a lot of the earlier games that would have trainers with like five Pokemon, but all of them very low level, like the Pokemon breeders back in Ruby and Sapphire, in hindsight, those battles feel very boring and not that well designed. You sweep through them very easily, because levels do make a very big difference in Pokemon. Then there's also the fact they've brought back the experience formula from Black and White that basically makes it so the lower level you are relative to the Pokémon that you beat, the more experience you get, and the higher you are, the less you get. This seems to be one of the most contentious things in Sun and Moon, but the divide is between two sects of the fandom that don't really intersect. The divide is between main story fans who like the balance that this brings, and post-game fans who hate the fact that it makes training up to level 100 much harder. Like I said earlier, there are many different ways to play Pokemon. You can't please everyone at once, and often one way of pleasing one group will alienate the other. It feels like this was the case here, although I kind of don't really agree with a lot of the arguments that the experience formula itself is to blame here. Why? Because black and white use the same experience formula, and yet you didn't hear people complaining about how hard it was to train up to level 100. In fact, it actually was not that difficult. Here's why I think the post-game training is a problem in Sun and Moon. It's not the experience formula, it's the fact that there are very few repeatable post-game fights. Black and White had the Nimbasa Sports Stadiums and Ordino, both of which provided decent experience for higher level Pokemon in the post-game, and in particular the Sports Stadiums, a lot of repeatable trainer fights that refreshed every day and all gave very decent experience. By contrast, in Sun and Moon, the only really repeatable post-game fights are the League, the Battle Buffet, which is absolutely terrible because all the opponents only have one Pokemon each and most of them are fairly low levels, and Game Freak Morimoto. That's it. Sun and Moon were the first Pokemon games where I've had to resort to training against wild Pokemon in the post-game. I normally don't ever need to do that because of the sheer abundance of repeatable post-game fights, but here there just weren't many, and that's where I feel the problem lies. This is what I hope Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon addresses. There should be more repeatable post-game trainer battles. 
But as it stands, the experience formula makes the main storyline a lot more balanced and helps stop the experience share from getting too out of hand the way that it did in Gen 6. While we're on the subject of battles and difficulty, let's talk about the main way in which these games are different from other ones, the trial and totem system. When I first heard about this, I was worried. I thought that replacing gym battles with just one Pokemon boss fights was going to make them a gigantic cakewalk, because generally speaking in the series, defeating one Pokemon is not hard at all. I was also worried there wouldn't be many of these. It seemed like there were only four or five trial captains that were revealed before the game was released. So I feared you'd have barely any of these. When I first started playing, my fears were kind of realised when I found the first totem, which for me being Moon, was Totem Alolan Raticate, to be utterly pathetic because you find the team of Brick Break right beforehand and, uh, yeah. Totem Gumshoes is a bit tougher due to not being quad weak to fighting, but it's still fairly easy. I didn't have much trouble with Totem Wishy Washy or Totem Salazzle either. And then I hit Totem Lurantis. Two sentences within the battle interface blew my mind. The first, Totem Lurantis' aura flared to life. Its speed rose sharply. The second, Totem Lurantis used Solar Blade. Totem Lurantis became fully charged due to its power herb. Oh man, did this fight end up being much more intense than I ever expected it to be. And I still feel it is one of the best designed boss fights in all of Pokemon, even though it is pretty difficult. It even summons allies that directly cover its weaknesses, Trumbeaks that use Rock Blast, and cast forms that will switch the weather to sun, not only so that it can fully heal itself with synthesis and spam its solar blade all the time, but will also use ridiculously powerful weather balls to destroy your bug or grass types that can try and resist it, or use water gun against your fire types outside of sun. And it was here that I realised, I had more fun with Totem Lurantis than I did for any gym leader in any main series game in the past. For the most part, gym leaders in Pokemon games have never been a challenge for me. Usually, you just sweep them with whatever they're weak to. Black and White were the only games where the gym leaders actually approached challenging to me. Here, though, the totems use very interesting and unexpected strategies, and I just love that. As weird as the comparison sounds, they felt more like bosses in a Shin Megami Tensei game than a Pokemon game, and that's pretty impressive. So, congratulations, Game Freak, you sold me on the idea of totem boss battles, even though I was sceptical at first. I know this is definitely a your mileage may vary issue, though, as I've heard a lot of people who found all of the totem boss fights very easy and don't see what the fuss is about. Anyway, though, one other thing about the main story that I think is great, HMs are finally dead. Good riddance. This is the natural evolution of a trend that started back in Gen 5. The original black and white made HMs optional, except for one use of cut at the very start of the game. Unfortunately, Gen 6 brought back a lot more forced HM usage. But here, the moment ride Pokemon were revealed, a lot of people were wondering whether they'd be replacing HMs, and it turns out, yes, yes they are. Me and many other fans of the series have always hated HMs. They generally force you to waste move slots on your team members on very, very subpar battle moves. Only a handful of HMs are actually good in battle, well, mainly just Surf. And often you're forced to effectively only have a 5 Pokemon strong team because you have to use the 6 slot on an HM slave. No need to worry about that anymore here, though. The other cool thing is that a lot of these ride Pokemon actually have secondary uses besides clearing obstacles. Taurus is effectively your substitute for the bike and being your fast movement, and Stoutland, while also being your item finder, has a slight niche in the fact that its standard walking speed is faster than Taurus's, so if you're tired of holding down the B button, it can be a pretty fast method of movement. Both Lapras and Sharpedo have interesting trade-offs when it comes to surfing. Lapras is much slower, but allows you to fish and gives you the normal encounter rate. Sharpedo is very fast, but it cuts the wild Pokemon encounter rate by a third, which is often a good thing, but if you're EV training, it's a very, very bad thing. So I found myself using Lapras a lot more in the post-game. 
I will say, though, the Machamp and Mudsdale rides were both a little bit uh, underutilized, in my opinion. Mudsdale is painfully slow and has absolutely no use outside of crossing rocky ground. I really wish they'd given it some other function so that it's... So that you have reason to use Mudsdale outside of the points where you have to. Much like with Taurus and its increased speed. Machamp? By the time you get Machamp, there's very few things that you actually need it to do. And like Mudsdale, there's no real reason to use it outside of its actual purpose. And very, very minor complaint, but uh, did the ride Pokemon for flying really have to be Charizard? And this is coming from someone whose favourite Pokemon is Charizard. The fact that it's the only non-Alola Dex Pokemon out of all the ride Pokemon is a pretty big red flag that it's more Gen 1 a pandering, which is kind of annoying. Speaking of the Alola Pokedex, though, that's something else that I want to talk about. I really like the Pokemon diversity in the Alola region, at least much more than I did X and Y. Now, X and Y did have a ton of Pokemon, but I just could not forgive them for the fact that the new Pokemon only made up 15% of the total Pokedex in a freaking new generation of all things. When I see a Pidgey in a game, I don't think, oh, nostalgia. I think, oh, great, as if I haven't seen enough of those in my day. I want to see new stuff. Or, let me put it another way, if I am seeing past generation Pokemon, I want to see them used in new ways. And that's something that I got from Sun and Moon's Pokedex. You got things like Lillipop, instead of an early game Pokemon like it was in Black and White, being an encounter restricted to the beginning of the second island. You had Fletchling, which was an early game Pokemon back in X and Y, now being more like a normal fire type and appearing in fire-themed areas, which I thought was really cool. You had Rufflet and Volibi showing up much earlier in the game than they did in Black and White. You had Bagon showing up as early as the first island, which admittedly can get a little horribly broken, if you're willing to grind for that 1% of a 1% chance of Salamence showing up. One of the reasons why I liked Black and White 2 so much is that while it did bring back a lot of old Pokemon, they didn't drown out the new ones, and they were used in new and interesting ways, like having Riolu being an early game Pokemon. And this really felt like the same thing. And while there were still a lot of past generation Pokemon in the game, I felt like they didn't squeeze the Alolan Pokemon out of the spotlight the way that the X and Y ones did. All the new Pokemon were still reasonably common within the areas they appeared. One of these old Pokemon used in a new way things that I thought was particularly brilliant was Smeagol. Now, Smeagol is a Pokemon that has pretty bad stats all across the board, but can learn every move in the game. Usually, by the time you get Smeagol, its stats are at the point where you never want to use it as an attacker, and in competitive play, obviously, that's a bad idea. It's pretty much regulated to being entirely support. However... While Smeagol's stats are bad by the standards of endgame Pokemon, they're actually quite good for early game standards. Because of this, I was pleasantly surprised when an early game battle against Ilima, who had a Smeagol, turned out to be a kind of tough wake-up call boss fight. Sure, an attacking Smeagol is terrible at the late game, but this early on, it's actually pretty decent, and it having the move that's super effective against your starter really forced you to learn type matchups and make sure that the rest of your team covered your starter's type. I never expected an attacking Smeagol of all things to be a wake-up call boss, but they made it one, and that felt really original to me. There are a couple of minor complaints that I have about the Pokemon distribution, though. The first are two early game Pokemon, Grubbin and Crabrawler. You have access to both of them very, very early on, but they can't reach their final forms until the very end of the game. This always bothered me. I actually originally wanted to use a Vika Vault on my main team for the storyline, and then I found out that you couldn't evolve it until Vast Pony Canyon, which isn't until the very end. Crabrawler, I also had one for quite a lot of the early game, but I was forced to dump it around the start of the third island because I found out that it couldn't evolve until Victory Road, and even then its evolution's not that great anyway. I just feel like... Why did they give us those Pokemon so early if we couldn't evolve them until so late? That just felt weird to me. 
The other issue is there was a bit of a drop off in terms of wild Pokemon diversity and even the general quality of the trainer fight to the storyline around halfway through the third island. At that point, almost all the wild Pokemon were, if you've been diligent in catching everything you've seen on every route like I was, they're all just evolved forms of Pokemon that you'll have caught already. And it being a little bit of a down point in the main storyline also made this segment of the game feel a bit disappointing. In general, I felt like the second island was my personal favourite in the main storyline. It had a good variety of environments, variety of types in the different trials and the Pokemon that appeared, and it wasn't over after you cleared all the trials on the island. The third island I was really looking forward to because it looked huge in all the maps I saw, but it's actually deceptively small. A lot of the areas of it, you don't actually get to travel through much of them. You skip a vast majority of the mountain via a bus trip. And the rest, I don't know about you, I just felt like it was a lot smaller than it was supposed to be. It didn't help that the desert was never even visited during the main storyline. And then the last island, there was only even one trial on that island. You suddenly get thrust into find the Kahuna very, very early, and you barely get to explore much of it until the post-game. Anyway, now it's time to talk about the main storyline. I kind of summed up earlier when I said they addressed a lot of the complaints about X and Y's storyline being a bit weak. X and Y got bogged down in the sheer number of rivals and friends. Barely any of them got any development because there were so many of them. Here, they dial back the numbers to basically three main characters. How... Gladion and Lily, and all of them got very good development throughout the story, and also both Hal and Gladion proved to be interesting fights, while also keeping the friendly rivals from some games, while bringing back the more competitive antagonistic rivals as well. I do wish you got to battle Gladion a bit more though. It was a little disappointing that he didn't even evolve his type Null until the last battle. These games were definitely much more character-driven than any past games, in fact, probably even more so than Black and White were, and I did really like pretty much all the characters in these games. Like I said, how Gladion and Lily all got good development over the course of the game. The Kahunas all had pretty good personalities and were actually pretty fun fights. I also want to say this, the Kahuna battle theme. I've never really liked a gym leader battle theme in the series besides the first one. I know that makes me sound like a Gen 1-er, but really none of the gym themes really grabbed me the way that that one did. Except for the Kahuna battle theme now. This was amazing, and I really, really loved it. In fact, generally all the battle themes in this game I thought were great. The only slight gripe that I had with the music was... Random trainer encounter themes. They all used exactly the same song. Ah, uh, one of the great things that I liked about the earlier games was that the different trainer classes had their own little musical jingles when you encountered each of them. It really helped make the trainer classes feel unique, but here, they all use the same song, which was kind of disappointing. Anyway, enough of that tangent. Let's go to, actually, the two trainer classes that don't use that song, the villainous teams of the game. Team Skull are pretty much what I expected, much more goofy and comical than the evil teams have been as of late, but they were intentionally designed this way, and for that they really succeeded. They gave me a great The World Ends With You vibe, and their whole gangster theme, it was really, really hilarious. It helped that even the characters in-universe don't take them seriously, which in my book is much better than unintentionally coming off as silly like original Ruby and Sapphire Magma and Aqua, or to me, Team Galactic. And then Team Skull turned out to have some surprisingly deep and dark backstory later in the game, which was pretty great. One thing that I will say, though, is... Plumeria, I felt, didn't really get to do all that much. It felt like she didn't even deserve her own battle theme, because you only battle her, like, twice or something? Maybe not even that, I forget. Oh, wait, no, you definitely do battle her twice, because I know that she has a Salazzle in the second one, but that's really all. And then, of course, there's ya boy Guzma. There's really not much I can say about him that other people haven't said already. I do like him. He has an interesting mix of being both comic relief and genuinely menacing as a villain. And he does have a lot of the best dialogue in the game. The only real complaint I have with Guzma is I do wish that he used more than two Pokemon for every encounter besides the last one. The final battle with him was great. The post-game battle with him was really great. 
In general, I really love the idea of a bug-themed evil team leader. It was pretty original seeing the vast majority of them have been dark and poison. And it was also really cool how, in terms of his positioning in the plot, he's effectively the bug-type trial captain. But yeah, I wish he had used more than two in his earlier encounters. And then we come to the real villains that everyone saw coming a mile away. The moment trailers painted these guys as benevolent Pokemon conservationists, as well as the fact that they had a very light motif, it was kind of obvious they were going to be a light is not good villainous group. The trek through the Aether base right after the third island was a part of the game that I really loved, mainly due to nostalgia in it bringing back memories of Colosseum. Did anyone else feel like it felt just like infiltrating a Cypher base? The Aether employees you fight even use a wide variety of types of Pokemon, just like Cypher Peons did. I did feel like Farber himself was a little underwhelming as an evil team admin, but that was made up for big time by the fight with Guzma afterwards, and then the big bad mother herself, Lusami... Um, how are you supposed to pronounce her name? I think with the Japanese it's actually Lusamine, but I don't know if it's meant to be Lusamine or... Whatever, I'm just going to call her Lusamine here. She was totally different as a villain to what I expected. Although her being Lily's mother was pretty obvious, she's definitely one of my favourite villains in the series. She's the only one who gives Getsus any competition, actually. But she still manages to be somewhat different from him, despite also being an abusive parent figure. Getsus clearly wanted to rule the world, while Lusamine was mostly concerned just with herself. And most of the damage she causes to the world isn't really even fully intended by her. It's just a consequence of the fact that she's completely uncaring about anything that isn't herself. And she just loves her sweet, sweet Ultra Beast so much that she wants to unleash them regardless of the damage it causes. Which in some ways makes her even more terrifying than a villain who's actively out to destroy the world. Because she's kind of like, sure, I might be damaging the world as a consequence of my actions, but I really don't care. There's also debate among the fans as to how much of her behaviour is genuine and how much is affected by the Nylagotoxin. Personally, I don't really go with the whole Nylagotoxin interpretation because I feel that cheapens her evilness a lot. Her music was great, both her main theme and battle themes. Her fights were pretty great too. I love how they gave her the gimmick of using a team of cute or pretty Pokemon. I thought that was pretty amazing actually, while still being somewhat challenging. The general way I summed up her team when I first fought her was if Dolores Umbridge was a Pokemon trainer. Her second fight involved giving all of her Pokemon totem-like auras, which made for a pretty interesting battle, and I've now witnessed firsthand just how devastating it can be in Nuzlocke's. As good as that was, though, I do feel like there's a little bit of a missed opportunity here. Personally, what I expected her second fight to be was her using an entire team of five Ultra Beasts. That probably would have been too difficult though, but even then, a lot of people wish that she actually used at least one Nylago, seeing how many of them she has floating around her before the fight. Some people also wish you actually fought her beast form itself as a totem-like battle. But anyway, I really did like Lusamine as a villain, and she gave great development for Lily throughout her story as well. The thing about the Ultra Beast though leads me to one issue that I did have with the game's plot though. For all the focus on Ultra Beasts, I did not like the fact that all of them besides Nylago was restricted to post-game fights only. You know that part of the game where right after you beat Lusamine for the first time, you see Ultra Beasts being released from wormholes all over the world, one for each island? I felt like at that point, you would have to go back to all the other islands and have a boss fight against an Ultra Beast on each one. But the kahunas take care of all of them for you off screen. I just really feel they should have had some presence during the main story, and should not have just been restricted to the post game. So after the Ultra Beast plot with Lusamine is all wrapped up, you're then told that there's going to be a Pokemon League. When I first heard this, I was actually a little disappointed. I was really hoping that Lusamine would be the final boss. And that to me, this was a more story-driven Pokemon game, and I felt like it didn't really need a Pokemon League. But, 
I quickly changed my tune once I actually got there, and found it to be one of the best Pokemon leagues we've had in a long time. I love the fact that some of the Elite Four members were people that you've got to know throughout your journey. I fully guessed that would happen, though I expected they'd be people like Hal, Lily, or Gladion. But they also threw in a curveball for people who were expecting that all the Kahunas would just be the Elite Four, which I felt would be very lazy. They added in Acerola and Kahila, two characters who were not Kahunas. The whole atmosphere of the Pokemon League this time is one of my favourites in the series, and finally the Elite Four was back to having five Pokemon outside of Challenge Mode, and all of their teams I felt were pretty well made and had pretty decent moves. And then we came to the actual champion. Now, I went into the League not knowing who the champion would be. Unfortunately, when I went and looked up music for the game, I got spoiled on who the champion was through thumbnails. Though, technically speaking, they aren't even the champion. There was no champion. You, having beaten the Elite Four for the first time, are the champion, and the final boss is just your final test to prove you're worthy of the title. And what a final boss it was. Kukui was, in my opinion, one of the best champion fights in the entire series. It was very hard to top Cynthia, but I think this game's actually did it. In a lot of ways, it's an apology for X and Y's champion, who was generally agreed to be one of the most disappointing in the entire series from both a story and gameplay standpoint. And many people, myself included, have been waiting for a Pokemon professor to be the final boss in a very long time. And Kukui really delivered. His fight was just amazing, even making use of some competitive level strategies, like having a Stealth Rock lead and using Whirlwind to spread around entry hazard damage. And the music. Wow. That music was incredible, and it was a really fitting tribute to the series' anniversary to actually remix parts of the Pokemon main theme into the Champion Battle theme. Which a lot of people have stated is your theme, not Kukui's. So that was a really great finale, and the ending and credits I thought were amazing as well. It was a little jerkish forcing you into a fight with Tapu Koko though. I had to quickly look up the internet when I did that, and found out that yes, you can knock it out and still come back in the post game and it'll respawn. Which is good, because I didn't have a synchronizer in my party at the time. The champion title defense though, when I first heard about it, I actually really liked the idea, but in practice, it's a little annoying that it's entirely random, and that you can't change who your opponents are by saving and reloading in the champion's room. I really want to see all of them, but I keep getting repeats of how Gladion and Kukui. But anyway, in general, I love this game's main story, definitely a big step up after X and Y. It might not quite beat Black and Whites to me personally, though. I suppose I could briefly talk about the Ultra Beast storyline in the post-game, which was pretty decent overall, finally actually getting to see the things besides Nyla go and fight them for yourself, and they seem to want to put Looker in every single game from now on, but one part of it that kind of annoyed me, Annabelle's presence. Now, I'm not objecting to the fact that Annabelle is in this game, she was a pretty cool Battle Frontier brain from Emerald and I like the callback. On a bit of a tangent, one thing I did love about this game was that it had cameos of characters from all across the series, not just Gen 1, including a lot of Gen 5 characters, which I really liked. Oh yeah, and Cena and Dexio! Wow, did my opinion of them improve with Sun and Moon. In X and Y, both of them were complete non-entities that I felt just had almost no reason to exist in the plot, and I totally hated them. Here, I really liked their presence and quite enjoyed them as recurring characters. But anyway, back to Annabelle. I felt like they had a totally original character here, and just decided to make them Annabelle for... reasons. Compare Annabelle's dialogue here to her dialogue as a frontier brain back in Emerald. Now, I know she barely had any dialogue back there, but even from as little as that, I can tell her personality is nothing like it is in Sun and Moon. So I kind of feel like they really should have just used an original character as Looker's assistant here. It wasn't necessary to have it be Annabelle. Now that I've discussed all I can about the main story, let's talk very briefly about the new Pokemon introduced in this generation. 
I'm not going to be able to say very much here, because normally I like to discuss every new Pokemon introduced in detail, and that would make this video far too long. But as a whole, the Alolan Pokemon are interesting. They're certainly a better bunch of new additions than some generations, but I don't feel they're the best overall. A lot of them are really slow for some reason. I guess they wanted to make Trick Room more viable, but it is kind of odd they have that kind of theme going on. The starters to me are kind of middle of the road. Actually, slightly above middle of the road to me. They're definitely not as bad to me as, say, Gen 5 starters, which all of them were pretty terrible except for Contrary Superior, but nowhere near up to the really good level of Gen 4 starters, where all of them were pretty much viable and competitive at some point, or Gen 3 starters, where one of them got outright banned, or Gen 1 starters, which got amazing with Gen 6's Mega Evolutions. But I do rank them definitely above Johto and Unova's starters. I never expected Decidueye to be Grass Ghost, but it's kind of a cool typing, though I am annoyed they introduce yet another Grass Ghost in the same generation. Seriously, why couldn't Delmize have been Grass Steel? Or Steel Ghost? It really makes Decidueye's type combination feel a lot less interesting that way. Though Primarina's Water Fairy was pretty awesome, and I'm so, so glad that Incineroar did not end up as another firefighting, because I probably would have freaked out if that had happened. Another thing in general is that it feels like they were trying to give every Alolan species its own unique gimmick. Like, for example, Mudsdale having the stamina ability, Pukumuku having a unique ability that damages the target when it attacks it, Wishy-washy having that whole school thing. Really, unique abilities are kind of the name of the game here. You'll see a lot of them on these new Pokémon, and it definitely feels like they wanted to make each individual new Pokémon family as unique as possible, either by way of that or a unique move only they get. Like Terminator's Shell Bomb. The effects of these kind of varied, but I still feel that quite a lot of the Alolan Pokemon are at least decent. I don't think any of them were really horrible, except for maybe Crabominable. But there definitely aren't that many standouts that are likely to become OU staples in the future. Besides the legendaries, of course, I'm talking about the Tapus, and I guess the Ultra Beasts as well. I do like that finally we have proper non-mascot legendaries now. I really didn't like how X and Y didn't have any minor legendary trio, instead they reused, of course, the Gen 1 trio. Here, we actually have a, well, it's a quadruplet this time, not a trio, but we actually have non-mascot legendaries now, and they are pretty cool, and all of them have contributed pretty interestingly towards the VGC scene. And then there's the other aspect of this generation, the Alolan forms. Contrary to what you might think, I am actually okay with most of them being from Kanto. I feel like the Kanto Pokemon, a lot of them are really showing their age. Their stats are not that good by modern standards. I know some of them have had some slight buffs, some of them have got Mega Evolutions, but really a lot of them needed a complete overhaul like this, and it has worked in a lot of cases. Take Muck, for example. Alolan Muck doesn't really have that much different in terms of stats than original Muck, but by adding the dark typing, it suddenly went from a pretty forgettable Pokemon to one that you actually see pretty often in competitive play since it's such a great Tapu counter. Then there's Alolan Ninetales. Years ago, you'd never expect to see Ninetales on World Championship teams. Now, not only is Ninetales much, much better, but Hail has been drastically improved by the addition of an actually good Snow Warning user, and the Aurora Veil move. I felt like most of the Alolan forms were great improvements over their originals. The only exceptions to me were Alolan Raticate, but original Raticate wasn't that great anyway, and Alolan Dugtrio, which I actually feel is worse than regular Dugtrio, because it lacks Arena Trap and uh, gains additional weaknesses, and gets that Tangling Hair ability which is totally useless because it can't survive attacks anyway. I do wish though that there were at least a couple of Johto Alolan forms. To me, the Johto Pokémon, barring a few very obvious exceptions like Skarmory and Tyranitar, have some of the worst stats of any batch of Pokémon in the series, and many of them could really desperately use an upgrade. I am looking at you, Ladian. So I felt they could really benefit from new forms. Maybe Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon will do something because Gold and Silver are coming out on Virtual Console soon, but I don't want to get my expectations too high.
As far as new mechanics go, Z moves I found to be pretty decent overall. Mega Evolution was kind of controversial, and some of them ended up being horrendously broken. Z moves I felt were reasonably balanced, although I did think they were a bit overpowered during the, uh, the totem battles in the main story. But as far as competitive goes, they add an interesting element of unpredictability to a lot of movesets. Do you give up your item for a one-time massive nuke attack, or do you go for a more reliable thing? You can also bluff Zed Crystals, or even use non-standard Zed Crystals on certain Pokémon. There's a lot of creative things you can do with them, and they have uses besides providing you with a really high power move. For example, Garchomp can use Zed-powered ground moves to have a single target ground move in double battles, when it normally doesn't really. I've seen really cool things done with Zed Crystals in the VGC scene, so I'm interested to see what happens going forward and how they're going to interact with Megastones once Megastones maybe become usable? I don't know. As far as other new mechanics go, I'm kinda eh on Hyper Training. It's definitely good in theory, and it helps make sure that normal Pokémon can finally stand up to hacks, but in practice, having to train up to level 100 in a game where, like I mentioned, it's actually pretty difficult to do that, that's annoying. I've never actually used Hyper Training myself personally, because I always prefer to train up to level 50 and not 100. As far as EV training goes in general, it's actually got both better and worse in this generation compared to 6th gen. Horde battles, sadly, are gone. This was annoying, as they were a very, very easy method of EV training. Their replacement is SOS chaining, which I felt to be very hit and miss. Firstly, it's actually a little tricky to keep track of how many effort points you've gained in SOS training, because the multiplier is a little bit weird in how it is. The fact that the first Pokémon in the battle does not count towards that multiplier. Very often, I've ended up with situations where I thought I was counting my effort points correctly, and then it turns out that I actually gained too many in a certain stat, and that's pretty bad. The other thing is, SOS battles are a little annoying in general, because of how luck-based they are. The general rule is, whenever you don't want Pokémon to call for help, they'll call for help constantly. Whenever you do want them to call for help, they never do. The fact that you can't throw a Pokéball until there's only one left, that is very, very irritating. I feel like if that was gone, a lot of the annoying factor of these battles would be eliminated as well, but sadly, that is the case. But there is one thing that makes effort training a lot better in this generation, though. Pokepelago. The Isle Evil Up, or as some people like to call it, the EV Bake Oven, which I think is an excellent nickname. Once this place is fully upgraded, which really isn't that hard, you can just stick Pokémon here and have them EV train themselves overnight. I know it sounds lazy, but you have no idea how much I love this feature. Often I have a bunch of extra baby Pokémon that I've bred that have good IVs, but uh, I already have something of the same species. But I can just stick these in the EV bake oven and have them EV train themselves just in case I ever need a second one of this Pokémon. I can have Pokémon EV training themselves while I'm in long periods where I'm taking a break from the game. It's just such a convenient feature. Not only that, but it's very easy to control exactly how many EVs you can gain in these, because you directly set how much points you want to gain, provided you know how much time corresponds to one effort point. This was generally the method that I relied on to create more complex EV spreads. Something that I should mention, super training being gone, I am 100% fine with that. I never cared for super training at all back in 6th gen, which might shock a lot of people. I've heard that a lot of people really love it, but to me, horde training made it totally irrelevant. It just took so long to get any meaningful gains in super training. Really, I only ever found myself using super training to take care of the last few effort points on a spread when I'd already maxed a couple of stats. I just found it so spectacularly useless otherwise, apart from getting elemental stones. Really, I did not care for super training in the slightest, and I'm fine that it's gone. I guess another convenient feature when it comes to training competitive Pokémon is that the Move Reminder can now teach you all the moves you have access to, even those that are above your current level. 
In the main story, this means it had to be put right at the Pokemon League, otherwise it would be a little bit overpowered. But I do like how convenient this makes training Pokemon, especially for people like me, who only train up to level 50, because that makes keeping track of VGC stat milestones much easier. But there are quite a few competitive features in these games that I'm really not too keen on them removing. Firstly, there's the fact that pretty much every extra battle type besides double battles are now gone. Now, I know a lot of people... I mean, not a lot of people play triple and rotation battles, but I always liked having the option of those. They had some creative strategies around them, and it's kind of sad that both of them have been gone just because of frame rate issues. I do like Battle Royales. They are actually pretty cool and have their own unique elements of strategy to them. For one, priority moves and protect are an absolute necessity there. But it is sad to see some old battling formats gone. The frame rate is definitely very annoying. You can tell that these games were clearly designed with the new 3DS in mind. Anyone playing on an original 3DS is going to suffer some slowdown. Now, one thing that I'm kind of okay about is, due to the generic arena backgrounds, multiplayer battles like online are usually totally exempt from lag, even double battles. So I find this pretty much okay. But during the main story, because of the battle backgrounds being so gorgeous now, oh man, does the frame rate take a huge hit in double battles, and sometimes not even just double battles. This is something that I do feel is a bit annoying, but it didn't really have my enjoyment of the game that much, because like I said, the lag is not too noticeable in multiplayer. What is noticeable in multiplayer, though? How much of an absolute hassle linking up with other players is now. Festival Plaza. I agree with many, many people. It sucks. Big time. While global missions are kind of fun, that's really the only thing that it has going for it. Now, I loved Join Avenue back in Black and White 2, but combining Join Avenue with Wi-Fi features, I really felt did not work that well at all. And it also meant that just being able to do a Link trade online, or even a Wonder trade, is hidden behind a huge array of confusing menus. Especially if you want to trade with someone you've organised a trade with on your friends list. I have organised many trades online, and very often, I've had to walk my trade partner through the complicated process of actually finding me on the list. Because it's just so non-intuitive. Gen 6's PSS was great, I don't see why they got rid of it. You can see everyone who's online right on the bottom screen, anyone who you've added the friend code of instantly shows up and you can just tap on their icon and just tap trade. It's as simple as that. Here, trading or battling with people on your friends list is such a hassle and it's so annoying. So seriously Game Freak, I know everyone loved Join Avenue, it was a great idea, but it's not a good idea to combine that with online multiplayer. It really does not work too well. Please bring back the PSS next generation. That was so much more convenient. I guess one other annoying feature that only became apparent later down the line is the complete lack of a national Pokedex outside of Pokemon Bank. It does feel kind of weird that they do this. Now, I've never been keen on Pokedex completion at all, so this doesn't affect me. But it does affect other people who do care about this, and it feels like quite a strange omission. I fully expected this to be patched in later on, but it just wasn't, so... I kind of hope that Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon do have this, at least. Anyway, that should be all of my main thoughts on Sun and Moon. And that's pretty much all I can say, so see you in the next video.